Hey YouTube. So I was going to review Photoshop 2021 until I actually used it and tried some of its new features and realized there's no point. There was nothing of real practical value that came out of that version of Photoshop. And in fact, you could probably say the same for the past few years. So instead, I wanna take this opportunity to expand upon my 2021 settings and workflow video, which seems to have taken off a little bit on YouTube alongside my videos on Canon R6. So I think people are interested in learning how a professional has set this program up for the maximum efficiency, the best results, the fastest working and stuff like that. But for those of you wondering what was released in Photoshop 2021 and why do I feel this way, then look no further than Neural Filters, which is their latest tech addition to Adobe Photoshop. It's not even theirs actually. You can find this stuff all over the internet. They've just found a way to package it neatly into their software so that you can use it through their user interface. We can talk about things like sky replacement, I've never once in my entire career needed to replace the sky in a photo. You know, when we're taking photos, we're looking at the model, the clothing, the product. Nobody's really looking at the sky, but it's cool to have, I guess. And then we've got things like auto colorize, black, going from black and white to color through a filter. It's really cool the way it works, but again, who's actually needing this stuff other than maybe some kind of restoration historical photo guy who's sitting there trying to restore old photos, it's not really everyday world kind of use and especially not commercial use. And then you could say, Alex, what about the aging, you know, making models younger and older? Again, this is very gimmicky kind of use of this technology. Unless I'm making a thumbnail to crack a joke with my friends on Instagram, nobody's using this in a practical way. Uh, you know, adding a smile to somebody's face that wasn't there before. Why didn't you just ask them to smile on set? Just take another select. You know, you should be taking multiple photos and choosing the best one, not manipulating that stuff in Photoshop. So it's really just a gimmick. To go even further on that, their AI model is not even trained that well. If you rotate the face too much, and it's not head on straightforward, the filter doesn't work at all. AI is only as good as they have taught the machine and they must have not put enough content with faces on an angle so it doesn't even recognize that there's a face there. In production, you need a tool to work almost all of the time, not once in a while. But I totally understand that this is the way the technology is heading and it's very important to understand and get to know what this stuff is doing. But you're not really missing anything right now. So that's enough about that. Let's just jump right into some more Photoshop. Here we are in Photoshop 2021 and you'll notice it looks exactly the same as Photoshop 2020. No changes in the UI, everything's where it used to be, which is great because I like knowing where things are. So first of all, we're gonna look at the overall canvas workspace here. You'll notice we're in window mode right now. We can move this window around, but once it's full size, you can't move this image around. So I like to hit the F key and go full screen. That way you can dig into the corners of this image. Hit F again to go into the kind of preview mode where you can remove all the UI and view your image in a nice artistic way without distractions. This is good for checking the final work to make sure it looks nice without the distraction of the UI around it. Hit F one more time to return to the window mode. Next, let's look at brushes. Hit the B key and try to use the shortcuts and resist the temptation to go into the toolbar and start clicking the buttons. The B key is the brush tool and you'll notice there is a circle showing how big the brush is gonna be. This is extremely handy. You wanna keep this on at all times. If it's missing, hit the caps lock key and you can see that it goes to a cursor here. Hit it again to bring back that circle. A couple other brush tips, hold the shift key and you can draw a straight line it prevents your hand from kind of wobbling. You can see that it prevents you from making a wiggly line. And as well, if you click and then hold shift after, you can do a straight diagonal line without actually dragging it across the, the entire length. If you want to make your brush bigger, most people will have the temptation to right click and then adjust the size and then take a little guess to see how big it was. Try not to do that. Try to use the bracket keys that way you can quickly line up, let's say I want to get her shoulder size here. You can quickly line up the reference circle that we just talked about so that you get a perfect size every time. With transparency, try to resist the temptation to start using this slider and then taking a guess at how transparent something is. All of the number keys on your keyboard 
correspond to a different transparency. One is 10%, five is 50%, and zero is 100%. And if you hit 55, it is 55%. So that is a really, really quick way to do transparencies. And that also works with the clone tool and even layers. Speaking of the layer panel, let's say we make a tiny little adjustment up in the corner. You'll notice that you can't see where it is on the layer. So I like to go into the panel settings, panel options, and change the layer thumbnail to the layer bounds, meaning the boundary of what the content is in the layer. And then there you can see it shrunk the thumbnail to the size of the content. So that way I know right away, okay, that layer is the one with the circle on it. Let's say we want to sample some color and we're using the eyedropper. You've got a couple options here. If you use point sample, there's a chance that you might choose the smallest little pixel that is a little bit too dark in the area or a little bit too light. And if you choose 31 by 31, you get this giant average of a color that might not be the color that you're trying to get. Let's say you want this dark mole, but it keeps giving you the average of the 31 pixels around it. So I find three by three and five by five the best results most of the time, but sometimes you have to change it. Let's say we're gonna do some cloning. You'll notice that when you alt click, it gives you a preview overlay of what you've copied and where it's gonna go. If you don't have this, you can go into window, clone source, and turn on the overlay. It's really handy or else you're just kind of guessing at how big and what you're putting where. This just makes life easy. And let's say you're trying to do something on a curve and you have a clone, but it just clones straight line. You can actually rotate the clone and if you click and hold it, it'll show you a preview of how much it's gonna rotate. That way you can get your sample and then start to clone in a slightly different angle. This is really handy for trying to clone on a curve. Many people may not realize that the clone tool has blending modes just like the layers panel. Even brushes have blending modes. This is really handy when you're cloning something like hair. When set to normal, the clone tool will clone the hair and the background. But when you set it to darken, it takes the dark hair and it only overwrites the, the lighter areas, making things darker. It will not make something dark lighter. It just takes a little bit of time to see all the blending modes and how powerful they are and when they can be used best. Let's say you've been working for a week or two or a month and your windows start to get out of order. It's a good idea to save your workspace the way you like it. I've made a workspace for 2021. Just say new workspace and name it, enable everything you've saved. And then once, you, once you've gotten out of order, you can hit reset and it'll snap your whole UI back to where you had it in the beginning the way you liked it. When making selections, sometimes it's hard to see if you nailed it the first time using the little marching ants. Hitting the Q button shows you a quick preview of what you've selected. And sometimes even then, it's a little bit hard to tell because of this semi-transparent red. You can actually increase it by double-clicking the quick mask icon, upping that to something like 90%, and then you can clearly see the separation of your selection versus the background. I use Quick Mask after every selection I've made just to double check to see how accurate it was. If you notice that you're always performing the same edit on every single image, consider making an action. It's as easy as clicking new action, naming it the kind of tool and technique that you're doing. Let's say levels and immediately it will start to record your action. So we'll do levels, we'll bring the image contrast in a little bit, and then hit stop. Now the next time I open this image, all I have to do is click play, and it will run that exact same function with all of those settings immediately. And then you can even batch that across an entire array of images, uh, as many as you like. And many editors start to accrue actions that they like, try to avoid using other people's actions because you won't know what they do, you won't learn how they were made, and it's, it's best to make your own, to understand the program and what all the tools are doing. That's the way to improve, not by taking somebody else's work. One last tip on brushes, sometimes if you have a very large brush tool you're trying to make, you get this kind of cloud bumpiness going on, and that can be changed in the brush settings. If you go to spacing, 
lower that to about like 5%. It'll be a little more taxing on your system, but you'll get a smooth line now. One neat little trick that took me a while to figure out. If you like working with an image in its full view, but you're trying to edit a specific area, you can actually open up a window of the exact same file without creating a duplicate of it by going to Window, Arrange, and New Window. That way you can have two windows for the same file, one zoomed in and one zoomed out. So all the edits you make can be viewed from two different perspectives. And there you go. That's it for now. Let's hope Adobe comes up with something more interesting in 2022. If you enjoyed this and learned something, please hit like and subscribe. Visit demonetphotography.com or my Instagram for even more info. Bye for now.